password that did, did more than that, I wanted something that managed users, did the password research, created users, sent out a welcome email, all that sort of boring stuff that everybody expects in a web application. And um, you know, you find yourself writing over there again. So, so what I did is I took um, I took all things Tensor, which is an existing module, and I uh, added quite a lot of features into it. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, well, this is sort of in two parts, really. It's um, a basic introduction to all things Tensor and, and how you do that to do user authentication. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about the additional features, like so most of which um, which I see as patches. Um, so, what why should you use all things Tensor? Um, the really powerful thing about it is you can get your authentication going with virtually no code into your web application, and I'll, I'll show that in a second. Um, but you can then follow that up later when you want to, to do the sort of tweaking and making it work the way you want. Because um, you know, let's face it, when you, when you start writing a web application, you don't want to start with boring stuff. Uh, you want to start with the stuff you want to do, but you still need something basic like user authentication to get it up and running. Um, the, the clues from the name, the, the extensible bit refers to the different providers you can have, so there's about four or five different uh, backends you can use. Um, and I'll just touch on, on a couple of those as we go through. Um, the, the patches that I wrote are actually only work with the DBIC provider, um, but they could potentially work with other providers, I just need some of these to, to patch that functionality into those providers. Um, if you're using existing DBIC schema, so if you're, using, um, if you're already using a DBIC schema for your web application, then you can straight away use that out of the box to, to manage your users and to, to authenticate them. Um, and it's got, like I said, it's got many user management features which I'll come on to and talk about in a second. Um, it's only for Dancer, or rather Dancer 2 really, uh, most of these features. There is the same module available for Dancer 1, um, but again, because I was using Dancer 2, that's, that's where I submitted my patches, but there's no reason why they couldn't be ported across to, um, to Dancer 1 if that's what you wanted. So how many people here have done Dancer? Okay, that's okay, really cool. that's good. Um, okay this, this is what I needed in my web applications. This is the stuff I found when I was writing over and again, and this is what we're going to go through. So I needed encrypted passwords, that's what it goes without saying really. Um, I need the ability of users to have different roles uh, within the application. I needed to know where they last logged in. Um, I needed the ability to update their details or for them to update their own details. Um, I needed the ability to get a creator user and then send a welcome email automatically so they can log in with their initial password. Um, and I want some password resets and the ability to expire passwords uh, if required. So this is, uh, this is a very basic example. This is um, this is using the most basic um, provider, which is the config provider. Um, for those who haven't worked with Dancer, uh, the Dancer, Dancer application is a config file. Um, normally, it'd be, well, it would start off very basic and then you'd ask something as you go. Um, in the config file, you put in there your configuration for any of the, the plugins that you're using. So in this case, you're putting in the, um, the configuration for the Orphix Dancer module. So as you look at that, just the first half of the screen there is what would go in your, your config YAML file. Um, and all it says there is that I'm, I'm using the Orphix Dancer module. Um, I'm going to disable roles, that, that's just something you can do to get um, things up and running in a bit more account, but you don't have to do that, of course. Um, and then you specify what round you have, so you can actually have more than one provider per uh, application, so you can have several different sources that your, your users should want to. I, I've never seen the need for that, but it's something that might be useful. Um, you give it a name and you say what, what the provider is. So in this uh, example, the provider is the config provider, and that just has the users hard coded into the uh, config file. Probably not something you want to get in your Probably not something that you're going to want to do for a production environment, but it might be a quick and easy way to get things up and running. Uh, so I just specify one user here, the user handy, and the password, which can be encrypted, um, should you need. Uh, so that goes in your config file, and then to use that in your dance application, you literally just need this, this in fact, you literally just need the require login um, keyword, and everything else is handled for you. So um, for those that are familiar with dance will recognise that, for those that aren't, it's probably fairly self explanatory, but that's just saying if they access um, uh, or URL uh, slash restricted, then they require a login to get there. And just with that code, that will automatically render some login pages, uh, or present them with the HTML form, and it will check the, their username and password against that. And once they've done that, um, it will then allow them into, the, uh, into that room and return or run the code in there. Uh, I, won't, I won't do a live demo, but I'll just show, show a quick screenshot. So that's, that's what you get. So very basic. Uh, but like I say, if you just want to get something up and running to begin with, then that's, that's really useful. So you're not spending time writing quite frankly boring HTML code. Um, all that's rendered for you. Um, and like I say, it's, um, there's a login and a login and it's automatically added to your application that, that does what, uh, what I've described. Um, the, the power of this is though is that you can then go on to change the status. So if you want to remove your uh, boring login page and do a feature one that fits with your web application, then you can do that later on, but you're not wasting time doing that initially. <laughs> Um, I'll just touch very briefly on 
roles, um, just to say that you can, you can do roles within the, uh, within the plugin. Um, you define the roles within the back end and then you say what roles that user requires to access a particular route. Um, so there's a couple of examples there, stolen straight from the, um, the documentation. Um, one that just requires a, a beer drinker role, so it requires that specific role, otherwise it won't let the user into that um, particular route. Uh, or you can specify one of the number of roles we're using um, an array of roles. Uh, okay, so that, that was the, the config example. I'm just going to do a quick uh, touch on the, the debug uh, example. Like, so that's what you'll actually have to use if you want to use a lot of these features that I'm going to go and talk about. Um, but you need, again, you need very little to get up and running. You've already got, you do need a debug schema, but I'm going to assume that you've already, you've already got that. Um, there's a separate debug plugin for Dancer, uh, which is fairly easy to use. Um, and once you've got that up and running, you, you literally just need to say that you're going to use the debug provider. Uh, there's lots of fairly sane defaults in there um, for the names of your table and the names of your columns. Uh, but at the minimum, you just need um, a user's table, uh, and the table needs to have a pink at the minimum, but you use no password column, and that's it. Um, and like I said, the, the defaults are fairly sane, but you do need to change them, um, but you just put that into the config file. But you can get away with as little as that in your config file. Um, so I've talked there about the authentication itself using two different backends. I'm now going to talk about the additional features um, which. Um, you know, really create the power of this module. Um, and you can start adding these into the configuration file as with, as with everything else. Um, so this one here is a password reset one. Um, something that's bad thing is probably the most boring thing I've had to write over and over again, password resets. I always think it's the last minute and then you've always got users asking how do I set my, reset my password. Um, so here you can add a reset password functionality just with adding these um, blue highlighted aspects into your configuration file. Um, all you say is that you want a, a password reset handler, just set that um, first keyword to true. Um, you say what mail you want to use. Uh, at the moment, uh, only a mail message um, mailer built into the module, just because that's the one that I was using. Um, but there's no reason why other ones couldn't be added. Um, or you can use your own subroutines to find separately, which I won't touch on. Uh, and then you just define who the emails are going to come from. Um, and that's it. And what you'll get for that is, um, is a screen. So the login, as soon as you set that um, parameter to true, your login screen will automatically have the password reset box and the dump button. Um, you know, again, you can customize this later if you want to, but the key here is that that's straight away added just with one line in the configuration file. Um, and that's, that's working straight out of the box. So if you put your username at the bottom there, um, click the submit button, you'll get emailed with the password reset link. Uh, fairly, again, with default text that you can customize at a later stage if you want to. Um, and like I said, at my last bullet point there, you can customize those functions to send the email and to create that content if you wish. Um, a variety of password functions. Um, uh, I've just given three examples there. So you can, uh, you can check a current user's password if you need to in your code just by using all these use the, uh, the user password. A keyword and that one will return true if that password is correct for the currently logged in user. Uh, the second example will check a password of a specific user, the first one's for whoever's logged in at the time. Um, and the third one will change a password, but only if they've entered the correct password for their current password. Um, so this again this is great users, like I said, a really easy way to add users to a system. Uh, and I didn't want to again mess about with how to issue passwords. So just by using this code here, there's a, a couple of examples there. The first one will just create a standard user uh, using the details on the realm provided. Uh, the second example, with the, um, the final keyword there, uh, email and welcome, such a true value will then send that user a welcome email. Uh, and obviously leave an email address there in order to, for them to be able to receive that. Um, but just calling that function in your dancer app will send that user an email with a welcome Bit of welcome text saying welcome to the application, and then it'll have the link in the same way as the password resets in order for them to set their first password. Uh, and again, that number box by default, it just sets them a, a random password, but obviously you can, you can change that if you need to. Uh, password expiry, like I said, I wanted, if that's some of the customers I was working with, they wanted to be able to expire people's passwords for, for obvious reasons. Um, and again, that's very easy, just the appropriate keywords into the configuration file, the top two there, just um, one to say what your column is in your database that you're storing the date and time of the last password reset. That will then get updated automatically whenever somebody changes their password. Uh, and then want to say when their password expires. Uh, so here, for example, 60 days. Uh, that itself won't actually do anything in the application. They'll still be able to carry on logging and using the application. You, um, you need to have some other code in for that. And the reason for that is that actually you might want to allow them into certain parts of your application rather than just denying them because they'll need to do things like change their password. 
Um, so you use this rather long keyword, <laughs> logged in user password expired, that's true. Um, then the password has expired, and as you can see here, I, I put this into the, the before book, so it'll be one item page. Um, if that comes back as true, then it'll redirect them to the password update page, um, unless they're already on that page to stop the uh, recursive loops. Um, one more example of time with last successful login. Um, again, just a one line configuration file, and that will automatically put into the database in that particular column, the last login column, when their password was last changed. Uh, and to get that information back, you just call that, uh, that function there, log to user last login, and that return a daytime object when they were last login. So, that's it, a fairly quick counter through. I mean, um, hopefully, what I've shown is that this is really quick and easy to get up and running. So, if, you, if you're doing a web application, uh, you don't want to spend time with all those things I've talked about. That will, the, the module will pretty much do all of those straight out of the box with maybe five or six configuration values in your config file. Um, and you need version of it in your, in your um, main data application. If you don't want to go on and customize it later, you can do you know, other things, different types of text, different look and feel, then you can do that at a later date, you know, maybe all your applications um, a little bit more stable. Or it might be, it just doesn't matter. Um, so that's it. Any uh, questions? So, um, so that's me, hello everyone. Um, up until a minute ago, 10% of us were out with my graduates. So, um, I'm, I'm uh, a geek uni. This is my, my uh, main hobby. Also, my largest point of my book, um, where I'm managing director and teacher and uh, waste journalist. It's like one of the main jobs. She must be a babe, we should need to do that. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going to talk about is another part of the job, which is so, Geek Uni, in case you didn't know, it's an online uh, school learning model. And so one of the main jobs is actually a, being a developer. And I'm going to show you something which I think you'll find interesting about developing teaching software. So it's not the kind of stuff that you come up against when you're dealing with a website where you have you know, a regular number of users and then there's a sale, you get bombarded and it all falls over servers. It's a different kind of scaling issue that they address here, but it may be to different uh, business goals. Oh, well, it's better. You tiny? I'm tiny. Okay, I'm tiny. So, um, heavy teaching learner. Here's the story. Just over a decade ago, I was an academic, that was me with the pony hat, and I had a class, it was my first, you know, proper tenure, I had a class of uh, 400 students, that was my welcoming gesture to the department, and 10 tutors. And the job was to teach from scratch. Sounds like an exciting thing to teach, and it wasn't. Uh, 
um, except that there are these 400 students and 10 tutors, and all we had resources for the two tests in the whole semester to get feedback on how they were going. And we had, before I got there, it had been there for 10 years, that, that course, we had a 70% um, failure rate or 80% failure rate. And so these people who are enrolled in the degree would, because they were learning Java with Windows, so for the four years of being enrolled in this degree, they would be repeating this bash class, semester after semester, trying to remember bash in the um, one day lead up to these exams, the rest of their degree. And you know, we get them through in the end. People would use their jobs, they can give people a little bump up to 49, 51. So how did it work? So they would be given some tasks and say, you know, find the file of blah in this directory or copy a file from it there. We would log what they were typing in their terminals. Then, at the end of the exam, it would be printed out and these four ten tutors would be stuck into a small room with very little ventilation for two days, reading through the bits of paper and determining whether the people who were doing the test knew what the hell they were doing with Bash. It was uh, devastating. So I thought, I can't go with this, there must be a solution. And this is what I thought it was. Actually, I had no idea who my heart was when I was there. But I thought if I could automate it and I have a little personal tutor bot to each of my students, then I wouldn't need these very unhappy tutors and they didn't grow up and do something else. So, it, was, it turned out to be very successful and it was all running on my, on my desktop computer for a few years. But these 400 students were getting through far more material passing the first year. So that was good. And I thought, let's turn this into a business. But in terms of scaling it to a larger market than one, one classroom for one students, I need to think about how to scale it. And the other thing is, I was going to teach Bash. I mean, that was going to be sleep. I wanted to teach it all. And one thing to sure, with all this automated feedback that I generated with Bash, I couldn't do that at all with the box and my desk because it takes a whole lot more computation to run PPI on people's code. So this is the architecture solution I've got. Has anyone heard of Moodle? Hands up if you've seen or heard of Moodle. Okay, so there's not very many people. Moodle is a, a um, learning management system is another one way Calling it, so you put your course materials. It's essentially a web thing, right? You put in your course materials. You have ways that you can create multiple choice tests just by pressing buttons. So I got Moodle, and I plugged in Mongol Hack, which then talks to AWS. To so that's the broker. It's all in AWS actually, but Moodle talks to the broker and says, create a new instance. Does everyone know what an instance is? Basically a virtual machine. For, and you get a virtual machine for each student and you run a tutor bot on that virtual machine. Those are the tutor bots that are running games. And, um, and then, so I say to them, go and buy this script which says hello world or write a little package which has a subroutine in it which blah blah blah. So the tutor bot looks at the code, parses it with PPI, and then, uh, then it runs it and looks at the artwork, doing things like putting it in the event page to, to actually look at the artwork data. Um, and then the data comes back and it lands on Google because they're being just particular question. So they got the terminal, they got the and it scales. And it scales because whenever there's a new student logging in who wants to do their exercises, they get a whole new instance with a tube bot. And they all just talk to each other with um, dance and rest calls. So it's actually very simple. 
And currently I've got two courses, and two courses, apart from different questions in Moodle, are simply two different virtual machines. And they have almost the same QDOT, except that it's got different, uh, different checks that they're doing. So the, the, the point I'm making here is that it's not only easy to scale for a single course, but it's also easy to plug in new courses. No changes anywhere else except that you get a different QDOT for a new course. So what do I want to say about the GUI? Alright, so this is just a description, uh, the, the picture of what I was telling you about. So the blue stuff is the question saying create a script which does blah, and then the tutorbot's response comes back with good, uh, you have one call to some method called debug in that, in that package, and bad, you haven't got your calls from warning, so PPI. So this is the, um, the less architecture oriented, but perhaps more interesting in terms of the code. So the tutor When I first did this in academia, teaching Bash, I had like five uh, checks that I was making what the student had done in their home directory for every exercise. So they'd say, good, good, bad, bad, bad. Five lines, and they'd know what they got wrong and they did this very quickly. When I started doing that with Perl, I realised that that wasn't going to work because when you're analysing the Perl code, there are easily a hundred checks that I'm doing from does the file exist to does it compile to whole lots of parsing things. And if I give them all the feedback, it would take up many screens and people would be um, slashing their wrists or departing. So I had to improve the user experience. And what I did is I found a way of, so every, every um, metric that I applied to students' code is just a little JSON snippet, actually it's a hash snippet. And these all have dependencies on each other. So I'm not going to check to see if the file compiles isn't digging in the right directory, things like that. So I say you have to pass this check if I try anything else that optimizes the course, but it also minimizes the amount of unnecessary information I'm throwing at the student. And that was achieved using graph directed, that module that done there, with a little bit of tweaking because not even the graph is very complex with all the dependencies. So I turned it into a bubble graph, and I haven't had time to actually write down what a bubble graph is. But inside each node of this graph, there's another graph, and you can go on um, con continuously putting a, a deep kind of um, more, more detailed graph. But the, um, the point is that they don't. If, if the students were to get all these ones right, they wouldn't get uh, a tick there, a tick there, a tick there information. They just say, this blob, that is, you know, that module works fine. This module works fine, but that module or the final app doesn't work fine. And so they, they get feedback at the right level of detail to better get the blog done in detail. And I think they come graph directed and PPI and Moose, they couldn't get it very easily to do that. So that's just my solution for giving automated feedback to people learning Perl. I think with Perl and other languages, people would have different ways of providing good, good feedback. So the point is it's all confined to TubeBot. If anybody wants to find TubeBot, then they're very welcome to. So, um, the, the, the first point is the architecture one, which is that in this case, and maybe in other cases, one can think of scaling and scalability as being
being part of the application rather than being just this top layer you put on top when you get it out the door. It's not true with flip sites in general, but there are other applications you can have to scale. Uh, I tried to compile all the complex stuff in the tube so that you can change and other people put theirs in. And the third point is me in, in my attempt to try and get other people involved. If you'd like to put together a course and cook up your own YouTube, then uh, let me know. I can get this shit. And that is it. There are my customers and sponsors. Um, Link one just here today. And um, oh, there's something else I want to say. I'm in the EPFC, and I, I triggered off uh, the idea of having this panel session of so everybody here knows that we have a problem in that some companies, not naming any names, have started to become a little bit not so keen on starting new core projects because they're worried that they're not going to be find enough core developers. And so the question is, how do we solve that problem? It is a problem, like, you know, we're all dedicated core developers, but at some point we have to change jobs, and then some of us are going to be leaving our employer in the work. So that, uh, that panel session is about addressing that question you might have run into the in the EFC and the people who say, and if not, send me an email and I'll include your thoughts in the session. That's it.